So good morning, everybody. Morning. Hopefully, uh, everybody uh, enjoyed uh, the Super Bowl. I know I certainly did. Um, I know that a lot of you are transplants and that you root for, for your teams back home and all that. Uh, but you're in Florida now, you're in Tampa now, and the home team is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And we just won the Super Bowl in our stadium. Had to get that out of my system. <laughs> Having said that, one of the things that really moved me at the Pastor's Summit was that at one point, at the beginning, we had a, a scripture from, uh, I think it was Proverbs 30, 33. No, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was Psalms 33, uh, verse, verse 1. And it talked about clap your hands and lift up a shout. And that group of men and women, that group of, of leaders of local churches blew the top off that place. I mean, they shouted as loud as we shouted for the bucks. They shouted for the Lord. And that was exciting to me because that is the right priority. Love my bucks. But God is so much more important than the bucks are. Okay? So, um... This morning we're going to take a little journey, and so I hope that you brought your Bibles with you. And I want you to open up your Bibles to uh, the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And uh, go with me uh, in your Bibles to, to Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to look at uh, a, this incident and later on another incident in the book of Joshua that were happening to uh, the people of Israel. So a little bit of a, of a background story, of course. The people of Israel had been captured. They'd been taken into captivity into Egypt where they served as slaves and all of that. And they had cried out to God. And God had heard their prayers and um, had taken this, this one outcast, um, this, this Moses guy, that had been, uh, was an Israelite, but he had been brought up in Pharaoh's court. And uh, he had ended up uh, killing someone uh, because he came to the defense of one of his people and, uh, and all that. Um, and, and so he had to, to, to flee. And he spent a lot of years in the desert. And he was an outcast then. And God called him to come and deliver his people. And uh, with much fear and trepidation, he came and, and he um, did what God asked him to do. He was obedient. And God, through seven plagues and, and through all the things that, that he did, working through Moses, he got Pharaoh to finally say, just, just get out of here. We've had enough of you. We've had enough of, of this stuff. Just leave. And not only did they leave... But the Bible tells us that they despoiled the Egyptians, that the Egyptians send them out with gold and, and food and all sorts of stuff. And then, of course, the people of, of, of Israel, they, they leave Egypt and they, they come against this body of water. Well, in the meantime, Pharaoh has gotten over grieving his son and the people of, of Egypt are going... Yeah, we got rid of them, but that also means that we got rid of all our slaves and manual labor. And so they kind of change their minds and they start to pursue the people of Israel. And the people of Israel have now left Egypt, but they're not in the promised land. They're in front of this huge body of water and they're thinking, okay, so... We, we got out of Egypt, but now we're going to die here on the shore? 
And so that's where we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 14. Let's start with verse 13, because all the people are groaning and mumbling against him because, you know, he's the one that, that represents God. So Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now at this point, Moses is presenting this brave front to the people and telling the people, come on, let's go do this. Uh, but like most of us that are leaders, behind the scenes, we go through our own stuff, through our own doubts, through our own times of depression, through our own, you know, stuff. And Moses was the same way. Now he's telling, yeah, people, let, let's go. But inside he's going, okay, you, you called me to this. You know, now what do I do? So then, so the first part of this was, was Moses talking to the people. The second part of this is the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. And so we're going to take a look at transition. And the, 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 the people of Israel were going through this tremendous transition. And what God chose to do through this time of transition, the journey that God was going to take his people on, so there are three stages to transition that we get from the verses that we'll look at today. First of all is closure. Second is conversion. And third is commissioning. Closure is when God brings the past to an end. He said, okay, you've, in, enough of what's going on. Um, it's time to move on. Conversion is the process that we go through when we experience significant transformation and a change of heart. God has to do an attitude adjustment in us because none of us like change, right? So he's got to get our hearts prepared. He's got to bring closure to the end, and then he's got to say, okay, let me now uh, do this attitude adjustment so that you'll be ready for what I have next. And the third part of that is the commissioning. Okay, now that you've got this attitude adjustment, here's what's coming next. We are renewed, restored, we're revitalized in the calling of God upon our lives. So the people of Israel find themselves in this process, in this journey, in this transition. God began by calling them out of Egypt and provided Moses, a man who knew the desert because he'd been hiding in the desert for many years, as their leader. And so he's, 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 selling, he's saying, I got you. You know, you've cried out to me. I've heard your prayers, you know, and, and it's time to move on. So Egypt is now going to be our past. It was necessary for a time. There were some things I needed to teach you in, in Egypt. But now Egypt is our past. Then he took them through the conversion process. God takes them to the desert and causes them to depend on him. They chose to stay in the deserts because of their actions. And then the commissioning process where we'll get a little bit to later where Joshua leads a warrior nation into the promised land to possess it. So let's start off with closure. Again, God brings the past to an end. Um, and, and what he, I, I can remember years back, I was at a leadership summit, and uh, the person that, that led the leadership summit uh, said something. He, he described this, um, this scenario that, that many pastors go through. Uh, pastors want to hear from God, and so 
you know, once a year or once every two or three years and all that. They'll, they'll, they'll go on a retreat by themselves, and they'll take their Bibles, and they'll take their journals and, and whatever else, and they'll go and just get away from everything, their families, their churches, all the, all the stuff that tugs on. They want to just spend time with God. And they spend some time with God, and all of a sudden they feel like they've got a download from God where God's revealed something to them. Maybe they took a, a, a book on, on, on this retreat and they read the book and, wow, this is fantastic. This is what God wants from our church. And, and so they get just amped up because God is telling them, this is, this, is, this is what I have for your church. And so, you know, by the end of the few days that the pastor has by himself, he is just on fire. He's excited. He can't wait back, you know, get back and talk to his board and talk to his elders. And he comes in and, and he just, you know, he's excited. He shares with them this great vision that, he, that they got from, he got from God. And that's the reaction that they get. And, and he's, going, but, but, but wait, why, why aren't you excited? Why aren't you excited for this vision the way that, that, that I am? And uh, one of the things that the, the leader of this conference said was, was I thought was, was really deep. He said there, there were two things that the pastor didn't take into account. Number one was the fact that his leaders thought that their church was doing great. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You, you've got this brand new vision. Why do we need a new vision? He hadn't laid the groundwork by telling them why there needed to be a new vision. Why where they were wasn't cutting it. Why what was happening wasn't what God had. Why they had gotten in a rut. Why um, so many things were happening that yet they were comfortable in it, but they weren't experiencing growth. They weren't experiencing the promises of God. And they needed to move on from where they were. And so God needed to do this with the people of Israel because they'd gotten used to living in this slavery. They didn't like it, but... You've heard expression, better the devil you know, right? And they knew what to expect in Egypt. So God needed to bring closure to them, to that experience. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be a death to self. Because let's be honest, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all what, you know, what I like. It's all about what I want to do, and, and, and I'm, it's all about my comfort. I, I, I'm alone with this? <laughs> so there needs to be a death to self where I'm willing to say, okay, this is not about me. Okay, God's got something else, and yet it might not be how I would do it, you know, because we all would like to be God for a day, right? Because so we could do it, you know, a different way. But there needs to be a death to self. And there needs to be a repentance from dead works, from realizing that a lot of what we've been doing hasn't worked, that a lot of what we've been doing is just spinning our wheels, that a lot of what we've been doing hasn't been leading people to Christ. We're not discipling people. We're not baptizing people. You know, or at least not what we'd like to be doing. So it needs to be a repentance from dead works. And then it needs to be this, this, this thing where we get to a place of, of reckoning yourself dead to sin and be willing to be alive in Christ. Closure requires reflection to question your internal motives. To say, okay... Am I upset about this because of me or am I upset about this for another reason? Why am I upset that change is happening? Why am I upset that I'm losing something? So it, it takes an internal question.
questioning our internal motives and it takes a, a, an external review and looking at what's around us and going, you know what, we were doing really good and then we kind of lost steam and we weren't doing so good. So maybe it's time for a change. So closure means that we have to recognize our failure and that we need to redirect in some way. So this is what God did with the people of Israel. He provided closure for them. But closure also requires us to take that first step. I talked about that last week, right? Um, taking that first step when, when you don't see anything there. But it also means looking that in the face. Yeah, now there's, there's a path where there wasn't a path before. But there's an ocean roaring around that path. And, will that wall hold up long enough for me to get through that path? I mean, let's be honest. You look at that and you go, yeah, no. <laughs> it's like my wife does. She, she shows me pictures of bridges. You know, from a, there was one bridge that was really crazy. It went up and down and, and it had this glass part and the glass was designed to look like the glass was actually cracked. And so, you know, you, you had to cross this. And, and you know, her, her first thing was, yeah, no. <laughs> and so we, when we're facing something like this, a lot of us may go, okay, let's, let's do it. But if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us are going to say, yeah, no. But we have to take that first step for closure to occur or else we get stuck in the past. Let's not go back to Egypt. Let's press forward to the promised land. Let's press forward to what God has for us. Or else we're going to be stuck in Egypt. We have to believe that what's ahead of us is better than what we left behind. So the second part is conversion. To be, it's the process whereby we put the past to rest and we begin to pick up our new identity. We begin to ask God, okay, what do you want me to do now? What do you want to work in me? Because as John Wimber used to say, God won't do anything through you that he hasn't done in you and to you first. He won't do anything through you that he hasn't done in you and to you first. You can't go places you haven't been yourself. I mean, you can't lead people into places that, that you haven't been willing to go yourself. So there's a transition from man's perspective, from our own perspective. Our focus is on departure and destination, accomplishment, arrival. The transition process from God's perspective is on the journey and it's on relationships. It's not so much about destinations. Yes, he's promised them a land of milk and honey. But there's a lot of stuff hanging on to them from Egypt that he needs to clean up first. And even though it's going to be a difficult 40-year journey, there are going to be some awesome things that are going to happen in the desert. I mean, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, that you know, that you know, that you know, that if it's there, man, we're in the right place, and if it's moving, we, we can go. Wouldn't you like that? I mean, how many of us would say, you know, I, I wish I knew what God wants to me. You know, where, where's my billboard? <laughs> you know, tell me what God wants to do next. They had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It's about the journey. It's about the journey. 
The conversion process is designed to lead us away from self-reliance into a more intimate place of surrender to all that God can accomplish. When we feel like we're in a place that's comfortable, it's because we feel like, yeah, I can handle this, right? And we don't like it when God says, take the step to someplace you've never been before because now there's a lot of un uncertainty and I don't know if I can handle it. But that's where he wants us because he doesn't want us handling it. He wants us relying on on him. Because of the way that we're wired, unfortunately, a lot of time that conversion process needs to take place in the desert. It needs to take place where, where God takes us out of our comfort zone and just pushes us out the door to where we find ourselves in this place where we go, oh, wow, I'm not sure that I like this. But God takes us there, and he accomplishes things in us. Let us not forget that it was God that led the people of Israel into the desert. Let us not forget that it was God that led Jesus into the desert to be tested. If he did that to the Israelites, if he did that to Jesus, why don't you think that he'd do it to us? God determines the place. We determine the amount of time it takes. We can either go in kicking and screaming and clawing and, and grabbing to, you know, the past. Or we can say, God, I'm open to whatever you want to do. Take you 40 years like it took the people of Israel. Or it can be 40 days like it took Jesus. It's your choice for the transition. Our authority in the kingdom is gained through our conversion process, not our commissioning. I have talked to many pastors, and I know my own experience, and it's amazing how many times they have told me Man, there were so many things that I needed to learn because I thought I had it. I thought I was, you know, even Pastor Carl shared with us where he thought that he was going to do great things for the kingdom. He thought he had it together and he had a lot to offer to God. God had to take him through a process. God called me to the ministry in 1972 wasn't until 1987 that I actually became a pastor. That's a lot of years in the wilderness. But I really needed to learn some things. And so what you see now is the result of that process. I have a saying that some of you, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me say, is that perfection is a destination. Excellence is a journey. We can't achieve perfection in this life. We can't achieve perfection until Christ comes back. We're in the here and the not yet of the kingdom of, of, of God, right? Christ came to establish a beachhead, and, 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 and we're expanding it and all that. And, and sometimes things work perfectly and sometimes they don't. In this world, you will have trouble. But when Christ comes back, we'll have reached that goal and perfection will set in. So perfection is a destination, but excellence 
is a journey. We want to try to live the way that Christ wants to live us. It wants us to live every day. So excellence is a journey, but the joy is in the journey. Uh, just recently, we drove someplace that we've driven quite a few times. The difference was that my wife doesn't like to drive. So if you go anywhere together, I'm the one that's driving. And, and, and the way that I was taught to drive was to be very focused. And so I'm focused on traffic. I'm focused on three cars ahead. I'm looking in my rearview mirrors. I'm, I'm, I've got the situational awareness around me. But I'm focused on my driving. I'm not a big talker when I'm driving because I, I like to focus on my driving. That's, that's the way that I was taught. I mean, every now and then you'll kind of look at something. Oh, my. But, but most of the time I'm just focused on my driving. This time my wife drove. And I was just kind of looking around, and I go, wow, look at all this stuff. It was amazing, all the stuff that I'd missed, because I was just so focused. And sometimes we're so focused on our destination, on getting there, that we miss what God is doing in the journey. Now go over to Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible. First book, five books were written by Moses, the Pentateuch. And then we go to Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, to Joshua 1. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, the word says this. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you have set your foot, as I promised Moses." Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to lay, obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And then a third time he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Conversion. We are now to a, to a different place. We've, we've been through closure. We've been through commissioning. I mean, to uh, conversion. Now we're going into commissioning. Commissioning begins with the internal work of preparation through closure and, commission, and, and conversion. Commissioning is consummating by an act of the Holy Spirit in which he releases a new vision to us, revealing our destiny, our sense of direction. This is now is the way that I want you to go. Commissioning requires people to take up that mantle, to take that step, to go and do what he's called us to do. It requires warriors 
to take the promised land by being confirmed, conformed to the image of Jesus. Commissioning says, this is your vision, but you're going to have to fight for it. It's not going to be a given. You're going to have to fight for it. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, from the days of John the Baptist, and he talks about how forcefully we are to lay hold of the kingdom of God because it is a battle. And a battle calls for warriors. The Holy Spirit commissions each and every one of us. We tend to think of those things as just happening to leaders. You know, Carl is ordained. Jay is ordained. In a year, we're going to lay hands on, on Nathan and, and, and if, if all goes the way that we expect it to and, and ordain him. But guess what? Commissioning happens to every single one of us because every one of us are to advance the kingdom of God. Every one of us is to make disciples. Let me read you something from the Vineyard website. Because for any of this to happen, it all starts with us believing that the Holy Spirit inspired the human authors of the Holy Scripture so that the Bible is without error in the original manuscripts. We receive the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments as our final absolute authority, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Therefore, we don't pick and choose which parts to believe. It is all God's revelation, and as such, he speaks to us through it. All of it, we don't get to pick and choose. I know that some people say, well, well, yeah, I believe in, in, in the stuff, you know, Jesus talked, because Jesus talked about love, but then some of this other stuff, man, you know, I, I don't know, that sounds a little bit archaic to me, or, or it doesn't fit in with our culture, or this or that or the other. Sorry if it offends you, but this is the word of God, and it's non-negotiable. And so if we're going to go into that promised land and we're going to do battle, we have to understand that this is non-negotiable. So this is what I'd like us to say together, this confession. Okay, let's, let's say it all together. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be right. Thank you, God, for your written word. You're probably wondering, okay, Jay, you're talking about closure, conversion, commissioning, and you just kind of just took a detour here. Where are you going with all this? What's, what's this rabbit trail that you're on? Here's the thing. You probably thought that this sermon was about us transitioning from Carl to Nathan. It's not. You probably thought that this was about us transitioning from the regent to the chapel at Fishhawk. It's not. This sermon is about understanding that God has prophetically told us that he is going to do a new work in Jesus' church, that he is going to pour out his spirit upon Jesus' church, that he is going to release signs and wonders through Jesus' church, that we are going to grow as we lead people to Christ and disciple them and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And in order to get there, he needs to take us through a transition. And our hearts need to be ready to get there.
So here's your task. Here's your homework. I want you to read your favorite gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, whichever one is your favorite one, read it. Then read the book of Acts so that you see what, what, what Christ taught his disciples and so that you see what happened in the early church. And then I want you to think, are those things happening in Jesus' church? Are those things happening in my life? Am I praying for people and they're getting converted? Am I praying for people and they're getting healed? Are there signs and wonders that accompany my life? If not, and his word is truth, like we talked about last week. If not, then it's time to get on our knees and urgently say, God, make this true in my life and make this true in Jesus' church. Most of you have never experienced this. I have. I can remember back to the early days of the vineyard. I can remember back to the, the days at, at, at the Clearwater Vineyard. And ministry time was, it was just expected that God's power was just going to come. And that, you know, there would be prophetic words and words of knowledge and words of wisdom, that people would get healed, that, that the front would just be people on the carpet just crying out to God and God ministering to them with the, through the Holy Spirit. That was the expectation. But it never just happened. It never just started that way. Wimber read the word and he prayed and he taught his staff for a year about healing. For a year. And he said not only did nothing happen but the people that were praying for the sick were getting sick from the people that they were praying for. And he was so frustrated. But he kept on because he believed the word of God to be true. And then God began to show up. Now let me warn you. Those of you that have never experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when God shows up, it's different. It can be a little freaky because you're going and seeing things that you've only read of in the Bible and now they're happening in real life. You remember a story that John Wimber said, you know, one of those Sundays when, you know, people were just all over the place, just, just, jumping and laughing and crying and, and, and flat on the floor and all that. And, and the day after them, as, as he was coming into his office, there was this group of people that, that you know, what's happening to our church? You know, how, 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 what are you going to do about this? The, you know, it looks like a bunch of crazy people and all that. And, 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 and Wimber just looked at them and, and, he, and he said, it'll go no further than this book. And then he smiled and said, haven't they read the book? <laughs> There's some crazy stuff in this book. We're on a journey. God has promised us a land of milk and honey. It's time to enter the conversion process. And let God work in us and through us. And let us plead with God. God, send your Holy Spirit. Let's stand together.
Daddy God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for bringing closure to the things in our past. Right now, for a little bit, you're leading us into that desert because you want us to let go of the things that we depend on. You want us to let go of the things that we're confident in so that we can get to a place of total dependence on you. Help us to lay it all down and help us to buy into your word and believe that it is true and that you're going to do the things in our life that you've done in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.